Good morning, and thank you for joining us today in today's training about physical capital needs assessment and fair housing accessibility requirements. I'm Dan Sullivan, Acting Director of Multifamily Development here at FHA. One of our good fortune in HUD is to have such strong leadership, and it's my privilege to introduce two Assistant Secretaries in the Office of Housing and Fair Housing who are co-sponsoring our training today. HUD staff and the industry have come to recognize these are the strongest leaders we could possibly have, and we're grateful for their serving at HUD. Carol J. Galante serves as Acting Assistant Secretary for Housing and FHA Commissioner here at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. She was originally appointed by President Barack Obama in March 2009 to lead the Office of Multifamily Housing Programs, where she oversaw the largest expansion in our portfolio and production in history. As FHA Commissioner, she has direct responsibility for oversight and administration of, among other things, all of our insured programs, both multifamily and health care, as well as over 20 percent of the single-family mortgages in our country. Carol graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University and holds a master's degree in urban and planning development from the University of California Berkeley. Prior to coming to HUD in Washington, D.C., Ms. Galante was a developer, owner, and president of Bridge Housing Corporation, the largest nonprofit developer of affordable mixed use, mixed income housing in California. Thank you for joining us today, Carol. John Trispina was nominated by President Obama to be Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity in April 2009. The Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity administers and enforces federal laws and establishes policy that makes sure that all Americans have equal and fair access to the housing of their choice. Before joining the Obama administration, Assistant Secretary Trisvina served as President and General Counsel to the Mex Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, working in the area of civil rights immigration, education, and related issues. Assistant Secretary Trisvina is a native of San Francisco, California, a graduate of Harvard University and Stanford Law School. His work in various capacities uh, during his career has included serving in city government as general counsel and staff director for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, as special counsel at the Department of Justice, and teaching at Stanford Law School. John and Carol, thank you both for your leadership and for opening our session today. And Commissioner Carol Galante is going to speak first. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for that kind introduction. And actually, thank you for all you're doing in multifamily housing to um, uh, improve and uh, make our work uh, so successful there. And I want to just take a minute and welcome everyone here in the room and uh, on the broadcast, lenders, needs assessors. Uh, I didn't know that was a technical term, Dan, um, but uh, needs assessment assessors, uh, HUD and uh, USDA staff and, and other colleagues. And I uh, want to uh, totally appreciate uh, those few brave souls on the West Coast who are up uh, incredibly early this morning uh, to join us uh, with this important uh, topic. So congratulations to you out there for uh, making it out of bed. Um, I want to just quote Secretary Donovan here for a minute because I think today is really a great example of something that he is so supportive and encouraging of around HUD, and that is uh, what we call silo busting, or what he calls silo busting. I mean, today is really an expression of this kind of cross-collaboration between the Office of Housing, uh, the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, and the Office of General Counsel uh, to bring uh, together this uh, training and this uh, effort. I think most of you know that um, we've already uh, proposed a uh, PCNA uh, uh, mortgagee letter, and it's uh, posted, published for comment, and we really do look forward to uh, getting your comments and your thoughts about any ways that uh, we can improve that. But today's session really does also, in addition to uh, 
our commitment to silo busting uh, really demonstrates our commitment to one of HUD's uh, key goals, and that is to support sustainable, inclusive uh, communities. And the administration is uh, very committed uh, to that goal. And as the FHA insured portfolio has grown, and I won't uh, spend too much time on that, but I do want to mention uh, for those who uh, may not uh, know this, that we have gone from insuring $2.8 billion a year uh, to over 12 uh, in 2008, to over $12 billion a year in 2011. So that's a, a huge uh, new uh, amount of opportunity in terms of uh, growth in the, in the business, and it's important that that production uh, is, is done well and is then maintained well uh, on, on all levels. And uh, we're improving our tools in multifamily uh, to uh, ensure that success, including in long-term asset management. And I just do want to really emphasize this. Uh, we have seen a, a very large shift in the multifamily portfolio uh, over the years from one that was primarily uh, subsidized with a variety of HUD subsidies like project-based Section 8 to one that frankly is 50% um, uh, market rate. And uh, these are important um, assets for the communities, providing generally uh, rental housing uh, provides affordable options for, for folks, but uh, it's also a different uh, character uh, in terms of some of the asset management strategies uh, that we need to take. And um, physical uh, improvements of these properties over time in ensuring that those uh, physical assessments are done and done well, and that as we um, improve properties and improve the physical quality of properties, uh, that we are taking into consideration uh, the needs for um, uh, physical quality and, in particular, um, access to persons with disabilities, which is what uh, today's training is, is all about. And I know you're going to get, you know, <laughs> way into the weeds on this, but you know, the bottom line is that accessible uh, rental housing is uh, not only good policy and good practice, it's also the law, and we want to make sure that we are um, helping our partners find uh, workable strategies uh, as uh, properties are uh, improved uh, over time, and there's you know, nothing, nothing more important than ensuring that we uh, do this well. So again, uh, I uh, will uh, exit stage left here so that you can hear from uh, Assistant Secretary Tresvenia, but I, I do want to just thank you all for your time and attention to this uh, very, very important topic and uh, look forward to hearing uh, about the outcome uh, when it's all, all done later this afternoon. So thank you all very much. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be your Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. It's great to be in partnership with you, Carol, uh, and with all of you this morning. I, I particularly want to commend uh, those of you here in this room. Uh, I think back of my, my teaching time at Stanford and, and other times, I never see the front row filled with people. So you almost have done your homework and your reading. Uh, and for those of you who are uh, joining us on, the, on, on this webcast, uh, particularly those of you on the West Coast, as Carol and I are both from San Francisco, we both very much appreciate your being up so early in the morning uh, to, be, to be part of this. Uh, this is, um, as between um, FHEO uh, and, and the Office of Housing, I think you are, everybody here, are partners. Partners in working cooperatively to address the housing needs of people with disabilities. So FHEO and HUD will work with you uh, in the process of making housing accessible, as efficient, as effective as possible for you and your organizations. Uh, training such as today's seminar, the draft, mortgagee letter that was issued, and other technical assistance such as the Fair Housing First program, uh, which you will learn more about today, are just part of HUD's ongoing commitment to you and your organizations to assist you in making more housing accessible for people with disabilities. Individuals with disabilities are not just a growing segment of your tenant base, they are in fact our fellow Americans and part of all our families. They may be our sons and daughters uh, who uh, fight for this country overseas, uh, may lose a limb uh, in combat, and then come home with mobility and other needs that they or their families didn't have uh, before going overseas. It may be our fathers and mothers fighting cancer, but be deprived of their mobility uh, by their illnesses. 
Uh, they may be our children, our brothers and sisters, may have cerebral palsy from birth. Uh, they ha all have in common a desire to live independent lives, the right to find housing that fulfills the accessibility requirements under the applic applicable civil rights laws. Uh, it is our shared responsibility uh, to make that the reality. And this is one area where uh, we are truly, as, uh, as a nation, we are in the lead internationally. If you go around to other countries, you don't typically see the curb cutouts. You don't typically see a lot of the things that we take for granted over, over in here in the United States over the past 20 or 30 years because of the Fair Housing Act, because of the ADA, because of other uh, adv advances. Uh, so we truly lead the world in this. Uh, we have ways to go, and you're instrumental in making that happen. Accessibility requirements don't have to be complex and technical. Uh, we firmly believe that le legal compliance can be achieved and the lives of people with disabilities materially enriched through our cooperative efforts. Today's seminar, well-crafted technical guidance on fulfilling accessibility requirements and ongoing technical assistance to answer your questions and any problems that you may encounter. So thank you for t attending today's session and your commitment throughout the year in this area. I want to ex particularly express my appreciation for the considerable efforts of HUD staff members involved in developing today's program, uh, Dan Sullivan, uh, David Walderman, uh, Sylvia Chapman, Janine Warden, Kathy Pennington, uh, our own Sarah Pratt from FHEO, uh, Joe Pelletier, uh, Janine Vias, Melissa Stegman, and Jack Mulgerry, also from FHEO, for devoting considerable time and working tirelessly to put the training together and to issue the important draft guidance for your benefit. We have put our best team on the field uh, for this effort, and you're going to hear uh, from the experts. So please carefully review the draft guidance uh, that was issued and provide us with your comments because we value and need your input and your active partnership with us in helping people with disabilities throughout the United States enjoy fuller and richer lives through accessible housing. Thank you all very, very much. Well, we appreciated uh, Commissioner Galante and Assistant Secretary Visvina um, giving those opening remarks, and it really does emphasize the collaborative effort between the Office of Housing, Multifamily Development, Fair Housing, as well as OGC, who have really been the uh, backbone of giving us guidance in these areas. Um, we have a full session today. We will take some breaks. We'll be announcing our other speakers as the panels come up. Um, if you do need to take a break um, in the middle, just uh, feel free to, but we will have some scheduled breaks as well. Um, if you have questions and you're here in the audience in HUD headquarters, um, use the whiteboard in the back. If you're viewing our session today by webcast, there is an email um, address that you can send your questions to, and we will attempt to answer those during the breaks, uh, collect those during the breaks and answer them during the question and answer time. And, uh, I'd like to introduce my associate, David Wilderman. And David, what is the um, uh, email address that questions should be sent to? So Dan, if folks are watching uh, out in the field, they can email us at accessibilityquestions at hud.gov. Accessibilityquestions, no spaces, at hud.gov. As well, all of our uh, training material, question and answers, and we hope helpful guidance is posted on the internet, and we will post, uh, share that uh, website with you on one of the slides in a few minutes. So our session today on addressing accessibility in capital needs assessment um, is, is driven by really the tremendous increase in volume, uh, particularly of refinancings. So there are numerous technical areas that as the FHA uh, production has blossomed and as HUD has tried to fill a critical need in, in addressing the lack of liquidity in the commercial real estate finance credit markets, um, we have to make choices about where do we do the training. It's become obvious that we needed to provide training in the area of fair housing accessibility. Um, as Commissioner Galante mentioned the production volume has increased tremendously and the platform has gone from a primarily subsidized assisted uh, uh, portfolio to 
50% of our units and transactions are market rate. Um, actually, probably close to three quarters of our dollar volume is now uh, based on market rate multifamily properties um, that have mortgage insurance. Uh, many of these, indeed most of these, were built after March 13, 1991, which turns out to be a significant date. Um, but whether it was built right after that or, or as recently as several years ago, we're finding in our production that many of the properties have Fair Housing Act issues. And by issues, what we really mean is noncompliance, and that becomes a problem. One of the key issues that we're facing fairly frequently is uh, uh, challenges in assessing accessibility uh, requirements in assisted housing. And there's some good reasons for that, one of which is that uh, a lot of these projects are older and they were built prior to the effective date of Section 504 and owners of these properties have an ongoing responsibility to uh, meet accessibility requirements and that's hard to assess. Another uh, issue that we're expecting to see more of is um, existing projects that become assisted after they were built. Um, uh, a, a tax credit resyndication, for example, that has a, a, a home loan as a soft second, or just an existing project that uh, a nonprofit uh, purchases and converts to affordable housing and has um, uh, a local home loan um, uh, soft second becomes assisted housing at that point and becomes subject to Section 504. So, Dan, I've been trying to think of some uh, metaphor or illustration that would uh, help crystallize the, the challenges and the difference in the challenge that we have in enforcing the Fair Housing Act uh, versus Section 504. And it occurred to me that if you thought of each of these statutes uh, as a light switch, you ask yourself, well, what kind of a light switch would the Fair Housing Act be? The Fair Housing Act would be a single pole light switch, on, off. If it's before, if the project's built before uh, March 13, 1991, switch is off. It stays off. It's always off. If it's built after that date, it's on, it's on full on, 100, 100 watts uh, bright light, and it stays on. If you're a Section 504 uh, statute, uh, you're more like a rheostat switch. And you push the button, you know, on a rheostat, and uh, oh, it comes on, but it may be kind of dim. And, but it stays on, and the event that causes it to come on or push that button is the fact that it gets federal assistance. So then you turn that rheostat, and the light gets brighter, or turn it down, it gets dimmer. Our problem is that we, when you go to assess a property like this, you don't know how bright it should be. And the reason you, that you don't know how bright it should be is that an owner of a property that uh, becomes assisted and was built before it became assisted has an ongoing responsibility to keep pushing that rheostat switch up toward the brightest level. That's his constant and ongoing responsibility. But when we're assessing it, we never know, well, exactly how far should he have gotten. That's, a, that's an issue that we're trying to deal with in, in the current guidance. In both our market rate stock and the assisted stock, which, as David has alluded to, have different um, th types of laws that apply to it, um, we've increased the scrutiny in our PCNA process through the risk mitigation initiatives that were um, implemented in the fall of 2010. Um, for both the market rate stock and the assisted stock have some level of accessibility requirements and our session today is going to go into great detail and hopefully be helpful in giving clarity on which one is an on-off switch and what happens when that light is on and, and the uh, more graduated requirements in the assisted stock. Regardless, um, in both our market rate production and our refinancing of subsidized properties, uh, PCNAs are now required for Section 223A7 refinancings. Section 223A7 provides authority for FHA to refinance, typically at lower interest rates, um, and possibly with an extension of the amortization period. Currently, 
FHA insured properties. As well, the risk mitigation notice required for all FHA insured properties initially endorsed after the implementation of that notice in the fall of 2010, that there would be a 10-year update to the PCNA. So what's happened, because we've applied the PCNA requirement not just to refinancings under uh, any project under Section 223F, but also applied that to 223A7, there's been increased scrutiny uh, in the whole area of our physical condition um, analysis, but particularly in this area of accessibility. Uh, Mr. Wilderman drafted this side, slide, but as we were reviewing it, I said, you know, that last bullet sounds like me, um, because what's happened is we've discovered, oops, the Section 223A7 uh, loan was initially insured by FHA HUD. Uh, the architect um, designed it and certified everything met code and met all requirements, including accessibility requirements. But then we find when we do the PCNA that the property, even if it was built after uh, 1991, and even if it had FHA mortgage insurance on it, it doesn't meet the fair housing accessibility requirements. So that is a true oops, and the question is, what do we do now? Well, one thing we could do is fire the PCNA analysis and go hire somebody that won't notice. And indeed, that's actually what people were doing. <laughs> and, or at least we got wind that that was happening. That was the wrong answer. Um, as a federal agency, and aside from the fact that we have a responsibility to enforce fair housing law, it's the right thing to do, is to make sure we get it into compliance. And so, really, I would say there's kind of two guiding principles that have formed our thinking as we've worked through these problems. One is fair housing accessibility is the law, and, and we have a general policy of obeying the law, right? We're the government. Indeed, we're the regulator and the enforcement agency for that law. So we're not going to compromise on this. Right? The law is the law, and people need to comply. And these requirements apply whether it's insured or any, whether regardless of the source of financing. So we're, we're taking kind of a hawkish position there. Uh, we are here to enforce the law. Second guiding principle, we want to be pragmatic in how we do that, right? to deal with reality as it is, not as how it was supposed to be. And so we've tried to be as flexible as possible in enforcing and in gaining compliance with the law in a way that works collaboratively, not just within the department, but with our partners as lenders and owners and others. So, David, did you want to address the slide? Sure. Uh, what we've seen in a lot of cases is a fair amount of confusion, and that, of course, is, uh, tells us that we, need, we needed to do this training. We've seen confusion about uh, which statute applies where. For example, when someone calls our office and wants to know what's the percentage of units that has to be set aside for mobility imp impairment and according to the Fair Housing Act? Well, gee, the answer is no none because that requirement applies to Section 504. Um, we've also had a fair amount of uh, angst about uh, how to fashion remedies. Okay, so we have a problem, now what do we do? How long can we take? How far we, do we have to go? Um, to what extent do we have to com comply? 100%, 99 what's okay? And that's a, hard, that's a hard question to answer, so we're going to be dealing with that. And the, the other thing that's, that we've seen is uh, creeping into our practice is a fair number of um, what I refer to as old wives' tales about the meaning of some of the uh, terms that we uh, that are bandied about. You hear, for example, uh, people simply, ref architects in particular, uh, refer simply to the ADA requirements, by which they mean everything in general. They do not specify what statute they're talking about. They just, they just call it the ADA requirements. And that can be confusing to people who don't spend all their days studying these statutes. Um, Another thing that, that's happened is that there's been confusion about um, the word adaptable. Um, 
And you can understand from the plain English meaning of the word that if something can be adapted, then that means that it can be changed, right? And then you think about the use of the word adaptable in the Fair Housing Act, and the notion is, well, there's something that we can do later, that we can change later. But in fact, the Fair Housing Act says that there are certain features, with respect to units, there are certain features of adaptable, adaptable design that must be present at uh, original design and construction. The fact that we describe these as adaptable features doesn't mean that, um, that they can be done later or at some, uh, on an as-needed basis. So these are some of the, the issues that we've noticed in cases uh, and in PCNA reports that have come to our attention. And so we're addressing these in, this, in the mortgage letter and in this training. Thanks, David. Just a note on the mortgagee letter that was posted for comment. I just want to express our recognition and appreciation for Deputy Assistant Secretary Marie Head, who runs our multifamily office and my direct boss. Um, she really led the effort in uh, helping us to get through these and as well as um, is giving us cover to say, well, we need to post these to try to get a, a public comment. And so um, we do would refer you to our website to review the mortgagee letter that we've drafted. Uh, just a word on the content of that document, much of it deals with issues around physical condition needs assessment other than accessibility. That's beyond the scope of our training today, but I did want to mention just uh, uh, by reference a couple of things that we've tried to do in that notice so that as you look at it and make comments, um, you can keep in mind what our intent was. One, we wanted to align development and asset management policy around sizing and setting of reserve for replacements. Um, there were different kind of uh, requirements and inconsistent application where there were conflicts between HUD offices, and so we've tried to address that by aligning and getting development and asset management on the same page. So this document reflects actually a full year of work by David Wilderman and uh, the asset management staff uh, in trying to bring those reserve for replacement requirements to be consistent. Previously, the PCNA required a, uh, an analysis of all of the major building components and their replacement life cycle over the life of the mortgage plus two years. So on a 223F with a 35-year amortization, we would want to see a reserve for replacement schedule that went out 37 years. As it turns out, we're just not that smart to predict uh, accurately what will happen 30 years from now. My teenage daughters will note I'm not that smart to predict what will happen this afternoon, uh, and they're right. But we do want to normalize our practice in the PCN area within FHA, not just between development and asset management, but also with public housing practice, rural, rural housing service at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as well as other forms of uh, subsidy and capital sources. Where we ended up was the uh, a 20 year period of analysis, really focusing on that first 10 years, but as well the second 10 years, and basing the minimum reserve for replacement balances on the average cost um, for uh, one year of that 20 year cycle. We go into great detail and clarify what we mean there uh, in, the, in the mortgagee letter and would invite your comment. In general, the PCNAs, uh, we found that they need more rigorous uh, analysis and write-up of the scope of work for repairs, um, as, and particularly for older properties, where we see 30-year, 40-year properties that don't propose a lot of repairs, and when we're uh, providing a long-term, fixed-rate, fully amortizing 30, 35-year amortization period, it's important that we have, uh, and in some cases requiring destructive testing even, tearing out the walls or going into the piping with microscopes and so on. Uh, it's important that we ensure the long-term physical integrity of the project. Uh, so the PCNA guidance does addresses a number of those areas. Again, that's not the main focus of our training today because the other piece that uh, uh, um, we've 
wrestled with is on this whole area of accessibility and that notice and mortgagee letter will address those areas and we wanted to use our training today to um, signal our intent and, and to give clarity at the technical level on these requirements. And so with respect to accessibility, uh, I've already mentioned that we deal with this um, question of whether adaptable means delay and it doesn't. And um, in addition, uh, with respect to uh, uh, assisted housing in Section 504, uh, we try to uh, help people understand how to deal with properties that were um, built with assistance prior to 1988, the effective date of the um, uh, of sec Section 504 uh, rules. Uh, and the way we've, uh, in, in brief, the way we've tried to resolve this is that we want the PCNA uh, needs assessor to, uh, to identify uh, all the deficiencies uh, as if it were uh, built after um, July 11th, 1988. And um, then the lender will need to reach a evaluate and reach a conclusion about whether any of these deficiencies uh, could be excused or, or uh, not resolved because of uh, ex exceptions, is what I call them, that are in the statute. Uh, for example, uh, if you if fix fixing something that's a problem requires that you relocate or alter a bearing wall, then that's not something that has to be done. Or if it's an undue financial and administrative burden, uh, which of course is a sub sub subjective judgment, but nonetheless, if if if, you, if a good case exists for that, then again, it's a, a remedy that might not be required. And of course, if if you're in the rare circumstance where um, you've never even changed the original construction, then there would be no occasion in which uh, a remedy would be required, except that there is in um, CFR 24.8. Point two four, um, a a a program requirement. That is, you, any and a project is a program, and program accessibility requires that you um, basically, uh, with respect to that rheostat switch, the owner needs to be always pushing it to a brighter light until he gets to 100% uh, compliance, and that obligation always exists, and it's not permissible to do nothing. That's the bottom line. So, uh, of course, any of you who inspect buildings know that it's going to be hard for you to know, well, how bright should it be? And that's something we're going to try to work on. So whenever there are non-compliance issues identified in a PCNA or otherwise in a project, we consider those critical repairs. They need to be done. It's a violation. It's a problem need to fix them. And ideally, what we'd like to see is, as any other critical repair, you fix them before we, we insure the loan or reinsure the loan. Having said that, we do recognize that in the spirit of trying to work collaboratively and solve problems, uh, uh, we may want to be flexible and allow those repairs to be deferred until, for instance, the loan closes and mortgage proceeds are available to conduct those repairs. In that case, there'll need to be a corrective action plan, which will be part of the PCNA. That correction action plan, there's a sample template posted on our website, and we'll be dealing in more detail with the content later. But I just wanted to mention that uh, while that's a part of the PCNA document, it's best to incorporate it as a separate attachment within that document so that it's detachable and can be used uh, for uh, tracking and review by uh, our Fair Housing Office and OGC and, and uh, people that aren't interested in the other aspects of the PCNA. I'll let you go ahead and cover that. Okay, uh, corrective action plans uh, are going to be uh, relatively straightforward, I think. They're going to have to describe physical remedies, estimate cost, set a specific schedule, and that schedule is the most expeditious possible, as fast as possible, but not more than a year without headquarters approval. Uh, it won't be the same as uh, ordinary repairs, which you basically get a year to do, um, and no one's too, too concerned if, uh, uh, you, you know, that if it could be less than a year, that it, that it get done in less than a year. Um, the, di the distinction here is that these repairs that 
that are responding to a fair housing or a Section 504 deficiency are repairs required by statute, essentially. And the timeline is as quick as possible because you've already gone through the red light. And so when, you know, if the officer stops you after you've gone through the red light, you don't say to the officer, well, uh, gosh, I'm on my way to the grocery store and I have to pick up the kids. Could we, let me check my calendar. Could we deal, deal with this tomorrow? Uh, that doesn't work. So the obligation is as soon as possible. And these corrective action plans, too, are uh, not a safe harbor. That is, they won't. We can't guarantee any owner that if they successfully execute a, a corrective action plan that they can't be sued. Um, but if I were an owner, I would certainly want a, a separate document uh, corrective action plan that shows that I did and other people agreed that I did what seemed to be best because that'll be better than nothing. David Wilderman and I were preparing for this and, and I noted that, you know, this is hard for developers to, to get this right. And David, your response was? Uh, yeah, it is hard. Hmm? <laughs> but it's the law. And have you ever done this? Oh, yes, actually I have. Um, um, in a former life, in fact, uh, in 1988, when the Fair Housing Act was passed, um, I was uh, developing apartments, uh, not for my own account, unfortunately, but nonetheless, developing a lot of apartments. And we recognized the significance of the act. We read about it in the trade press. We saw that we had 30 months to get ready to implement it. And so we essentially arranged a, a charrette. I arranged it with um, our architect, our construction guys, the supers, the management people. We sat down and went over all of our designs and we incorporated all the requirements to comply with the Fair Housing Act. And guess what? If, uh, our units were better. And you'll find this out if you ever go to uh, help your son or daughter uh, move. And I guess with current economic situation, a lot of people have kids at home, and when they ask you to help them move, you'll be ready and willing to do that. But you want to ask first whether or not uh, they're moving into a fair housing compliant unit, because that heavy dresser that your uh, wife you know, wants to get rid of and wants to give to the kids, you're going to have to carry it in. And those wider hallways, wider doors, will all make it a lot easier. So David's comment to me was, yes, it's hard, but it's doable. I've done it. And you can too. Hopefully our training today will help you in that effort. Uh, when I um, get phone calls from lenders or others and they'll describe the situation, sometimes I say, you know, you need an architect. And sometimes I say, you need to talk to David Wilderman. But a lot of times I say, you need a lawyer. And, and, and sometimes I say, we need a lawyer. As it turns out, we've got them. And indeed, they'll be coming up for our next panel. As they come up, I wanted to um, show the website um, for the uh, uh, comments that you can submit um, through the trade associations up to June 1st. And just give you a minute to jot down that website location, and you can access these as our uh, OGC panel comes up for the next segment, and David Wilderman will introduce them.
Okay, I'd like to introduce our panelists from the Office of General Counsel. On my far left, your far right, is Janine Warden, and next to Janine is uh, Janine Vallez, and then Kathleen Pennington, and then Melissa Stegman. Uh, have at it. Thank you for attending this training. Um, during this session, we're going to start out by discussing the Fair Housing Act, then move into Section 504, and then the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm going to start out by discussing in some detail what triggers application of the Fair Housing Act, and Kathleen Pennington will discuss some other important aspects of the act, including non-compliance and some rejected defenses. And Janine Valles will discuss Section 504, which is triggered by the receipt of federal financial assistance. And Janine Warden will discuss Title II and Title III of the ADA. The Fair Housing Act was a major piece of civil rights legislation passed as the Civil Rights Act of 1968. The Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing. In 1968, the act originally included race, color, national origin, and religion as protected classes. And in 1974, sex was added as a protected class. In 1988, the act was amended extensively and included greater enforcement mechanisms. Importantly, it also added two additional protected classes, familial status and, for our purposes today, disability. Aside from the prohibition on discriminating, the act includes some affirmative obligations toward people with disabilities. These affirmative obligations include what we're discussing today, the design and construction of accessible multifamily housing. And I want to make it very clear that requests for reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications occur on an individual basis and are different from the design and construction requirements. So an individual who's living in the housing must initiate a request for an accommodation or modification. And on the other hand, the requirements for design and construction do not wait until someone requests them or requests any kind of accessible feature. The requirements must be met at initial construction. Um, and although this isn't the focus of the training, just to give you a quick understanding of what a reasonable accommodation, a reasonable modification is, an accommodation is a change, exception, or an adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, or service that's necessary for someone with a disability, disability to be able to enjoy their, their dwelling. So for instance, an individual with a mobility impairment may request an assigned parking space close to their unit. A reasonable modification is a structural change made to the premises um, in order that the person with the disability has full enjoyment of the premises. So this can be structural changes to the interiors and exteriors, as well to common and public use areas. So for example, a tenant whose arthritis impairs their um, ability to you know, turn doorknobs in their apartment might request for the doorknobs to be replaced with levers. Or a person needs a ramp outside the building in a common area to be able to, to get around in that area. So again, the um, housing provider must assess these requests on an individual basis, and these are different from the design and construction requirements. In the House report, the, uh, the Congress expressed its clear intent regarding the disability provisions of the Fair Housing Act. And the goal of independent living, as I think you heard Assistant Secretary Trezvina say earlier, um, is, is really the goal of this, and that's at the core of increasing the stock of accessible housing. And Congress was intending to strike a balance through these design and construction requirements to facilitate the ability of people to fully enjoy their units, yet not impose unreasonable requirements on builders and making it easy to incorporate these designs into the housing construction. Congress believed these requirements were modest and were going to include features that did not look unusual or add significant cost. In a very telling statement, the House report stated that a person using a wheelchair is just as effectively excluded from the opportunity to live in a particular dwelling 
by the lack of access into a unit by two narrow doorways as a posted sign saying, no handicapped people allowed. Now, the portion of the Fair Housing Act, which includes the design and construction provisions, is at 42 U.S.C. 3604F. Um, so the law states that those involved in the design and construction of multifamily housing must ensure that the public and common use areas are accessible and usable to persons with disabilities, ensure all the doors le leading into and within the premises are wide enough to allow passage by persons in wheelchairs, ensure the dwelling premises contain features of, there's that word, adaptive design, including an accessible route into and through the dwelling, environmental controls in accessible locations, reinforcements and bathroom walls to allow later installation of grab bars, and usable kitchens and bathrooms so that a person in a wheelchair can maneuver in the space. And the specifics of these requirements will be covered in Sarah Pratt's presentation. Um, so you may ask, well, who has to comply with these requirements? Basically, the answer to that is anyone who is involved in the design or construction. This can include varied individuals and entities, as cited in the slide. Um, it could be developers, architects, engineers, builders, contractors, owners, etc. And if there is an enforcement action, there is joint and several or shared liability for all the individuals and entities that were involved in the design and construction. Next, I'm going to discuss how do you know whether the Fair Housing Act's design and construction requirements apply. When do you know whether, as Dave was explaining, when the light bulb is on? So the requirements apply to covered multifamily dwellings designed and constructed for first occupancy after March 13, 1991. So we're going to try to break this down a little bit more. So covered multifamily dwellings, what are they? So if you have a building with at least one elevator and at least four dwelling units, then all of the dwelling units must comply with the requirements. If you have a building without an elevator and you have at least four dwelling units, all of the ground floor units must comply. So the Fair Housing Act does not have any requirement for the percentage of units that must comply. This definition of what is a covered multifamily dwelling is what's going to control. And Um, this is true whether the housing is for rental or for sale, whether it's privately or publicly funded. Examples may include condos, co-ops, apartment buildings, timeshares, nursing homes, etc. And there are certain types of buildings which are not going to be covered by the, the design and construction requirements. These include detached single-family houses, duplexes and triplexes, multi-story townhomes without elevators, and renovations and substantial rehabilitation of pre-1991 buildings. But note that detached single-family houses and other types of housing that include federal, state, or local financial assistance may be required to be accessible under other laws other than the Fair Housing Act. So now that we know what covered multifamily dwellings means, let's turn to the meaning of first occupancy. Recall that the Fair Housing Act's design and construction requirements apply to covered multifamily dwellings designed and constructed for first occupancy after March 13, 1991. The determination of first occupancy is made on a building by building basis. A building was not constructed for first occupancy and thus is not covered by the requirements if the building was occupied on or before March 13th 1991, as you can see, that's kind of the magic date here, or the last building permit or renewal of a building permit was issued before June 15, 1990. A building is going to be considered occupied if you have a certificate of occupancy issued and at least one unit is occupied. If it's a rental unit, you must have a signed lease and a resident possessing the unit. If the unit was sold, the new owner must have completed settlement and moved into the unit. So let's say you have an existing pre-1991 building that does not have to comply with the design and construction requirements. But let's say you construct an addition as an extension to an existing building. 
the addition of four or more units is regarded as a new building and must meet the design and construction requirements. If any new public and common use areas are added, they must be accessible. And then in cases where the facade of a building is preserved, but the interior of the building, including all of the structural portions, the floors and the ceiling, is removed, and a new building is constructed behind the old facade, that building is going to be considered a new building for the purposes of the Fair Housing Act and therefore must comply with the requirements. And this may seem obvious, but it, it bears repeating. Buildings which were designed and constructed to be in compliance with the Fair Housing Act cannot be renovated in a way that you're removing any of the accessible features. So now I'll turn it over to Kathleen Pennington, who will take us through the remainder of the Fair Housing Act presentation. So you may wonder, how do you go about complying with them? And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because that's what Sarah will do, but I want to talk about the guidance that HUD has put out over the years um, it, for standards and, and means of complying with those larger um, requirements that are specified in the Act itself. Now, in 1991, when the requirements went into effect, um, HUD published what it called its guidelines for um, compliance. They provide technical guidance to builders and developers on how to comply. They're very specific, <coughs> very detailed. There are charts in there and graphs. Um, this, I'll, I'll just hold this up because if you haven't seen this before, you want to get it. Um, it's kind of your Bible for complying. You guys have it here. You can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, anyhow, this, um, in the back of this manual are the guidelines themselves. The guidelines were the first bit of um, guidance, I would say, other than the preamble to the regulations, which came out in 89, that really gave some specifics about how the accessibility requirements in the Fair Housing Act, um, how you needed to, what you needed to do to comply. Um, in, in 1994, HUD, out, HUD put out some additional guidance in the form of questions and answers that were really specific uh, answers to questions that were commonly asked in that three-year time period between when the guidelines came out. They're um, it's sort of uh, common issues that people weren't really sure about. And they also are in this um, manual, in the back of the manual. Can you hear me yet? Can people hear me? Okay. I'll just keep talking and hopefully you'll hear me. Um, but there, there was... Um, there were people out there who really weren't happy with the guidelines themselves, and they weren't sure that there was going to be um, compliance. We were seeing a lot of non-compliance back then with the, um, the Fair Housing Act, and there was a movement. This was a, um, a project that was very important to Secretary Cuomo when he was the Secretary of HUD. Um, the, the movement was to look at all of the model building codes that were out there and see whether they weren't consistent with the Fair Housing Act. Uh, requirements, and if in fact they were, then they could be deemed as safe harbors, and perhaps other um, standards of accessibility could be deemed as safe harbors too. So HUD undertook a project to review the, the, the then building codes as well as ANSI A117.1, which is, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, uh, an accessibility standard that's been around for I think like 50 years, um, contains requirements for very accessible units, or at least more accessible than what you have under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, so this review, you can imagine, took quite a while. We looked at all, all of the then building, model building codes, there were four at the time, um, and HUD published a document, uh, gave advice, worked with the model code uh, organizations, gave them advice on what types of things were missing from their codes that needed to be included, Things were added to the code, and um, once that was done, um, HUD deemed certain, um, certain of these codes to be safe harbors, meaning that if you complied with those codes, as opposed to the guidelines or something else. Excuse me, Kathleen. Um, we're really not able to work out the sound on your mic, so would you mind coming to the podium, please?
hopefully you all can hear me now. Um, anyhow, um, we, we um, it went through this review, many, looked at all the model building codes, deemed certain codes to be safe harbors. Um, those codes, for the most part, um, were Um, I'm a little discombobulated. Let me start back again. Um, the purpose of the review, really, of the, of the codes was because builders wanted to be sure that they could comply. And typically, they were following their local code, building code. The idea was that if we could incorporate the requirements of the Fair Housing Act into those codes, the model codes were typically, I'm sure you know this, um, the standards that were then adopted by states and localities. So if the state and locality adopted the code and the designer or the builder followed their local building code, the idea was that they would comply with the Fair Housing Act and they wouldn't have to worry about an additional requirement. It would just be naturally built into the code. And I, I think that that has really worked. Um, there um, have been, this, this original uh, review, code review was done in 99 and 2000. There have been additional reviews since that time. There are now 10 safe harbors. All of these safe harbors incorporate the requirements of the Fair Housing Act. So if, if your state or locality has adopted this building code and you're following it, if the building code was adopted, I should say, without any change, um, you will be in compliance with the Fair Housing Act. Um, you, you can choose a particular safe harbor, but you can't cherry pick. You can't say, I want to comply with this portion of one code and this portion of another code. That's not permitted. What are these 10 safe harbors? Um, the main one, at least the one that we, uh, that I consider to be the Bible, is this design manual, uh, this, what we call the design manual, the book that I just held up before, which contains um, extensive detail on how HUD interprets the guidelines and what they mean. It's, it's really fabulously helpful book. Um, if you have any questions when you're doing inspections, I would suggest that you look at the book because it will answer those questions. Um, other safe harbors are the different uh, versions of ANSI A117.1. 1986 version um, is the one that was in effect at the time that HUD well, at the time that the Fair Housing Act was passed and when HUD first published its um, guidelines for accessibility. Uh, the statute specifically refers to ANSI A117 as being a safe harbor, meaning that you can comply with it. Now, if you do use the, uh, the ANSI standard, you will not know what scoping requirements there are, though. So you need to still look at the regulations and the act to see what units do I need to make compliant? Um, whereas if you look, just look at ANSI, you wouldn't um, necessarily know what those scoping requirements are. The model building codes do have the scoping requirements built into them, though. So if you follow the codes, you, you will not have to look back at the act. Um, the, the other safe harbors, um, I think, ANSI has been deemed a safe harbor for 92, 98, and 2003. Um, the review for the later versions uh, has not occurred yet, but it will be. Um, the other building codes that we initially looked at back in 2000 have pretty much gone away other than the International Building Code. The International Building Code has been deemed a safe harbor for 2003, 2006, um, 2009, and 2002, back when we did the initial review. Um, and I checked, and all 50 states and four, uh, all four, four U.S. territories have adopted and currently use some version of the IBC. Most of them are using 2006. Um, others are using 2009, which has not yet been reviewed by HUD, but should be um, soon. And um, it, that would mean, really, essentially, that anybody who's following that code should, as long as they're actually following the code, um, be in compliance and not have to worry about whether or not they're complying with the Fair Housing Act. Um, David talked earlier about the um, adaptable phrase that has um, confused people, I guess. It doesn't mean that you can add the features later on. You have to do them now. Um, the Fair Housing Act is um, enforced by HUD, by the Department of Justice, by state and local fair housing enforcement agencies, and by anybody else who wants to bring their own lawsuit. Any person who's disabled 
and is interested in moving into a, an apartment complex, say, that's not accessible, is free to file their own complaint against that builder, that developer, anyone who's involved in the design and construction. So um, for anyone who has properties out there that are not compliant, you want to make sure that you bring them into compliance. And, and that's one reason why we're so happy about this um, initiative that the Fair House, uh, Federal Housing Administration has going here with this new guidance is we really, we all want to make sure that accessibility is, is in all of the units out there that should be compliant. Um, one of Congress's goals really was that we could age in place, that people wouldn't need to move out of their homes because they'd have the features that they need when they needed accessibility features down the line. So we really want to make sure that happens. But if, if it doesn't happen and you get sued, it's extraordinarily expensive. You, you really want to, to, to include these features from the start because going back and retrofitting is, is very, very expensive. It also means that you're in all likelihood going to have to pay damages to victims. Um, the Department of Justice typically settles their cases with um, victims' funds, meaning that persons with disabilities will receive money out of that fund for the discrimination of the curb because they were not able to access the complex. Also civil penalties. Um, in federal court, if it's a case brought by Department of Justice, a first-time offense can be a $55,000 civil penalty. Here at HUD, it's a $16,000 penalty. Um, so it, it's really quite expensive. I have a bunch of slides um, on types of settlements that have been really costly, just to give people an example. I won't go through them. Um, but the, the, the bottom line really is that you're not going to win one of these cases, somebody who tries to fight them. And I've litigated a number of them. People try to fight them to the bitter end. And they never win, and they always have to pay in the end. Um, so not only are you paying all the retrofitting costs, damages, penalties, you got to pay your lawyer and you got to pay your expert. Um, so it, it's fabulous, I think, that people are being encouraged through this process to make those retrofits without litigation. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the defenses that we've heard over the years, which. Um, <coughs> of course are rejected. I mean, David made it clear, it's the law. It is the law. There are no excuses. Um, one, of the, one of the most common, common excuses is, well, I, I'm sorry, I just didn't know. And the, the subcategory, I like to call it the subcategory that we used to get a lot, of, um, a lot of the time in the early days was, well, HUD didn't, HUD didn't tell me about it. HUD didn't educate me on it. Well, HUD did educate people. and design professionals and builders really are expected to know about laws that apply to them. So courts are not going to, they're not going to excuse anybody from compliance with the law because they said they didn't know about the law. Um, they're also not going to excuse anybody because they didn't both design and construct. The statute says design or construct. Anyone who's involved at all in the design or construction is going to be liable for that noncompliance. Unless, of course, say they're the architect who actually designed accessible plans and the builder didn't follow them. I have seen that many times. Um, you are not going to be excused because you made changes down the line. You're liable for, you know, if somebody, somebody was denied housing, files a complaint, and the builder then goes ahead and makes retrofits, ret retrofits they're still liable for that discrimination that occurred to that person when they came in. They can't say to the court, well, I, I comply now. Um, so better to comply sooner rather than later. Um, you also do not have a defense because you relied on your architect, if you're the builder, or if you relied on your site engineer. You are responsible as the, as the builder, as the developer, for everything that occurs. And you um, are participating in the design and construction, and therefore are liable. Um, another claim that we get oftentimes um, from defendants and respondents in these types of cases is, well, no one who was disabled, disabled applied, and there aren't very many people who live in the area that are disabled, so there's really no need for these units. I should really only have to make a certain percentage compliant. Well, that's not what the statute says. The statute says 100% if it's ground floor. 100% of the ground floor units, if there's no elevator, it says 100% of the units if there is an elevator. 
So it doesn't matter that there might not be that many people in the area that might apply to live. The statute says all units. Um, and housing is there forever. There are gonna be people who wanna move in at any point down the line, and there may be people who live there, like you and me, who get older and need these features, who um, need the accessibility features, and that's why they need to be there upfront in 100% of the units. Um, and we talked about the, um, will adapt when somebody else moves in, so I won't, I won't talk about that. But I, I did wanna also mention, um, I don't have this on a slide, but David mentioned this. Um, I heard this many times from builders. People don't want to rent these units because they don't like the way they look. They, they don't want a unit that has accessibility features in them. Well, the units don't look any different. And the truth is that people actually like these units much better. The bathrooms are a lot bigger. The, the doorways are wider. They're just more comfortable for everyone to live in. Um, and it, it really is a fabulous thing to have accessibility in these units, and, it, and, it, and it's, I, I just, I'm really thankful to all of you that you're participating in this training because I think it's really gonna be a big help to everybody um, to get more and greater accessibility. So, five, uh, the Fair Housing Act actually is probably, as you probably got this from David, kind of the easier, um, easier statute to understand in some ways than 504 but I'll now pass that on to Janine to explain to you. Good morning, everybody. So I'm gonna discuss Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Section 504 prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs or activities that are receiving federal financial assistance. Specifically, the statute provides that no otherwise qualified individual with disabilities shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity that's receiving federal financial assistance from the department. HUD's Section 504 regulations are at 24 CFR Parts 8 and 9. So who must comply with Section 504? The trigger is receipt of federal financial assistance. The regulations define a recipient as a state or its political subdivision, any instrumentality of a state or its political subdivision, any public or private agency, institution, organization, or other entity, or any person to which federal financial assistance is extended for any program or activity, and this can be either directly or indirectly through another recipient, but it excludes the ultimate beneficiary of the assistance. So what qualifies as federal financial assistance? Federal financial assistance is broadly defined under HUD Section 504 regulations. It refers to any assistance that's provided or otherwise made available by the department. And this can be through a grant, a loan, a contract, or any other arrangement. Assistance can be in the form of funds, services of federal personnel, or real or personal property, or any interest in or use of such property. And this includes transfers or leases of property as well. I wanted to give you some examples of HUD-funded programs or activities and entities that are subject to Section 504. So common entities would be public housing authorities, recipients that are operating any kind of HUD-assisted housing, also states, cities, and counties that receive federal funds. I also wanted to offer some common examples of types of federal funding that you may be seeing in uh, the developments that you deal with. Examples would include Section 811, that's the Supportive Housing Program for Persons with Disabilities, HUD Section 202 for the Elderly Program, the Project-Based Voucher Program, also the Tax Credit Assistance Program, known as TCAP, our Home Investment Partnership Program, HAFA Program, which is our Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS Program, also Community Development Assistance Programs, and the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, NSP. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but I, we thought it would be helpful just to offer you some examples of common types of federal funding that you may see in mixed finance developments. 
So as enforced by HUD, Section 504 requires non-discrimination because of disability. It also requires recipients to take, effective, uh, take appropriate steps to ensure effective communications with applicants, beneficiaries, and the public. Recipients of federal financial assistance are also required to make reasonable accommodations similar to the, what's required under the Fair Housing Act in rules, policies, practices, and procedures in order to na enable an applicant or a resident with a disability an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling unit, common areas, or any aspect of the federally assisted program or activity. Also, recipients of federal financial assistance are required to make and or pay for structural changes when they're needed as a reasonable accommodation. Another basic requirement is that recipients administering programs activities are required to do so in the most integrated a set setting appropriate to the needs of persons with disabilities. Th that brings us to the idea concept of physical access, which is of course the focus of today's training. Physical accessibility requirements under Section 504. The requirement to make new and existing housing and non-housing facilities accessible for persons with disabilities. This includes dwelling units, public and common use areas. The specific requirements you're going to find in subpart C of HUD section 504 regs, which are again at 24 CFR part 8. There's an overarching requirement in our regulations that state that generally a person with a disability should not be denied the benefits of, excluded from participation in, or be subjected to discrimination in a program or activity that's receiving federal funds because the recipient's facilities are inaccessible or in unusable by persons with disabilities. And now I'm going to get into the specific requirements of what's required by 504. So we're going to go through this step by step and hopefully it will help by referring you to which sections of the regs to look at. And we're going to start with new construction. So new multifamily housing projects shall be designed and constructed to be readily accessible to and usable by persons with disabilities. The regs define a multifamily housing project as a project containing five or more dwelling units. And this was effective July 11th, 1988. What this means is that at least 5% of the units in a project, or one unit, whichever is greater, must be accessible to people with mobility impairments. An additional 2% of the units in a multifamily project, or at least one unit, whichever is greater, must also be accessible to people with vision or hearing impairments. In circumstances where greater need is demonstrated, HUD can also prescribe higher percentages or numbers. And this can be in response to demonstrated need or in response to an evidence of need for a higher percentage or number in response to any other manner. Accessible units must be on an accessible route from site arrival points and they need to be connected by an accessible route to public and common use facilities located elsewhere on the site. Required accessible units must be distributed throughout the projects and sites and need to be available in su a sufficient range of sizes and amenities to provo provide meaningful housing choice for people with disabilities. All right, so that's new construction and we're moving now on now to alterations of existing housing facilities. First, the concept of substantial alterations. This refers to multifamily housing projects with 15 or more dwelling units when the cost of your alterations is at least 75% of the replacement cost of the completed facility. If you meet the definition for substantial alterations, then the new construction re requirements that we just, just discussed are triggered. Finally, other alterations. So these would be alterations that do not rise to the level of substantial alterations, meaning the cost of the alterations is not at least 75% of the replacement cost of the facility. Such alterations need to be made accessible to the maximum extent feasible. So what does that mean? Up to the point that would constitute an undue financial and administrative burden on the operation of the multifamily housing project. If achieving accessibility would constitute an undue burden, 
then accessibility needs to be achieved up to the point of the undue burden. Additional requirements for other alterations. If you have alterations of, to single elements or spaces of a dwelling unit, when they're considered together, if they amount to an alteration of the dwelling unit, the entire dwelling unit would need to be made accessible. So to give you an example, if you had alterations to a dwelling unit bathroom, a kitchen, and an entryway, then that would trigger the requirement that you make the entire dwelling unit accessible. This requirement applies up to the point where you have 5% of accessible units. After that point, you're not required to make any additional units accessible under this provision, but of course you would always still need to make alterations that are necessary to meet the ongoing needs of individual occupants who have disabilities. And finally, alterations to common areas or parts of facilities that affect the accessibility of existing housing facilities must, to the, to the maximum extent feasible, be made accessible. Now I want to discuss existing housing facilities. <clears throat> a recipient of federal financial assistance is required to ensure that their existing housing program or activity is accessible as a whole for persons with disabilities. So this does not require making each existing facility accessible or require taking action that would result in a fundamental alteration in the nature of their program or activity or an undue financial administrative burden. But in general, persons with disabilities need to have an equal opportunity to participate in the federally funded program or activity and to have the same range of choices and amenities as those that are offered to others. And finally, with this, this entire time we've been talking about making individual units, the common areas, accessible to people with disabilities, I wanted to touch on the accessibility standard that HUD uses for purposes of Section 504 compliance. Currently, HUD uses the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards, and you can find a copy of UFAS on the U.S. Access Board's website. Any departures from the technical or the scoping requirements are permitted only where substantially equivalent or greater access to and use usability of the building is provided. As you may know, the U.S. Access Board issued new Americans with Disabilities Act and Architectural Barriers Act accessibility guidelines in 2004. Those guidelines are separated out, so you have a separate scoping section under the ADA, a scoping section under the ADA, and then technical provisions that apply for both. The ABA accessibility guidelines, once they're adopted by HUD as HUD's enforcement standard, will, will replace UFAS. Once the ABA accessibility standards are adopted by HUD, they would apply to generally just to new construction and to alterations, and they generally would not apply to existing facilities that are in compliance with 504 and UFAS, except where they're altered. However, HUD recipients are not required to comply with the new guidelines for purposes of Section 504 until HUD adopts them as enforceable standards. And with that, I'm going to move on to a discussion of the requirements under the ADA. So um, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, although um, David was absolutely correct, everyone always said, oh, I know all about those ADA requirements and we comply with them in housing. Well. Um, Actually, the ADA is the statute that is probably the most forgotten when it comes to housing because um, people looked at the old standards, what people used to call ADAG, and they looked for provisions in those standards that said residential dwelling units, and they didn't see anything, and so they thought, oh, boy, we don't have to do anything. Unfortunately, that was not correct. So the ADA was enacted to, um, it took the requirements of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and expanded them to a lot of entities. There's no requirement for receipt of federal financial assistance in order to be covered by the ADA. And there are two provisions of the ADA that I'm going to talk about today. There are Title II of the ADA and Title III of the ADA. Um, 
Title II of the ADA applies to state and local government entities. And when I talk about Title II, it covers programs, services, activities, and facilities. So um, the Supreme Court actually issued a ruling in a case where um, uh, the state of Pennsylvania uh, attempted to argue that certain of its facilities, namely prisons, were not covered by Title II. And the Supreme Court said, no, all means all. All program services, activities, and facilities of the state or local government are covered by Title II. Uh, the other provision I'm going to talk about is Title III of the ADA, and with respect to the design and construction provisions of Title III of the ADA, what's covered are public accommodations. Those are places that are open to the public and commercial facilities. Um, who is liable under the design and construction requirements of the ADA, um, anyone who participated in the building process, just as Kathleen described under the Fair Housing Act, plus um, the owner and operator of a facility. Uh, for those interested in knowing HUD's role under the ADA, HUD is the agency that is designated to investigate complaints and conduct compliance reviews under Title II of the ADA with respect to state and local government entities. Um, the Department of Justice also can do it, but HUD is the agency with expertise in the areas of public and assisted housing in particular. Uh, HUD does not play a role in the enforcement of Title III of the ADA. That's done by the Justice Department. As with the Fair Housing Act, anyone can file a suit under the ADA for the failure to provide accessible facilities and damages and civil penalties that can be awarded under the ADA are very similar to what Kathleen described with respect to the Fair Housing Act. And for major entities, where a suit has occurred, um, uh, if it's a national entity with facilities in many places where the Department of Justice has done an enforcement action, it is not unheard of to have a price tag in the millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars to bring facilities into compliance. And with respect to state and local governments, the Justice Department has a program where it picks a city or county, goes out and surveys all of the facilities, and requires all of the facilities to be made accessible in compliance with the ADA. And it's luck of the draw. The department um, picks based on demographic standards, uh, demographic information relating to where people with disabilities live, and in all parts of the United States. More specifically, Title II of the ADA covers programs, services, and activities of state and local governments. Um, and as I said before, it doesn't depend on the receipt of federal financial assistance. And the, the regulations of the Department of Justice are located at um, Part 28 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 25, uh, Part 35, excuse me. And, um, Title II covers um, housing um, that is built, operated, or sponsored by state or local governments. And when I talk about sponsored, what I'm talking about is when a state or local government has what is a housing program. And oftentimes, there will be a state housing finance agency that um, assists in the financing of affordable housing. And if a state has that kind of a program in place, then the housing that has been financed through the use of tax credits or tax-exempt bonds is covered by Title II of the ADA as part of the state's program. Uh, occasionally, less often, local governments also participate 
in assisting in the financing of housing. And you'll also find some of them are covered, possibly smaller entities such as group homes. So um, covered entities include public housing authorities um, and entities operating with CDBG, uh, housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, home funds, and other types of HUD funding are typically covered by Title II of the ADA as well as Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And it's not at all uncommon to have um, both of those statutes apply. Um, Title III of the ADA applies to um, public accommodations. And um, we give you some examples in the slides of what are public accommodations, um, rental or leasing offices, sales offices in um, private housing developments, homeless shelters, um, commercial spaces that are associated with housing such as daycare centers, group homes, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, um, assisted living facilities, um, any kind of housing that has a social services take to it is covered. Um, and if it's a state or local government sponsored, that would be under Title II of the ADA. And if it's a private entity that's been involved in it, it's covered by Title III of the ADA. And the Title III regulations are at um, 28 CFR Part 36. Um, in the architectural requirements of the ADA, um, all newly constructed facilities must be designed and constructed in accordance with DOJ standards. Now, you might wonder about the dates for the ADA. When you're talking about state and local facilities, new construction is anything that occurred that was built after January 26, 1992. For Title III of the ADA, um, Congress and the Department of Justice thought private entities should have a little bit longer to come um, into a position to comply with the law. So the date for new construction for private entities is January 26, 1993. They received an additional year to figure out how to comply. Um, the same dates apply to alterations, and um, all alterations after those dates must be done in accordance with Department of Justice standards. And um, Kathleen showed you a book that, uh, to give you a sense of what we're talking about. This is the current version of the Department of Justice standards. Um, and these standards um, are the new standards that were adopted uh, September 15th of 2010. And this book covers both Title II and Title III of the ADA. Like Section 504, um, the ADA also applies to existing facilities. Under Title II of the ADA, the term that is used to talk about how the ADA applies to existing facilities is program accessibility. And program accessibility, similar to what is used under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, is the concept that the program in its entirety must um, be readily accessible to and usable for individuals with disabilities. Now you might say, well, if the program has to be accessible, how do I deal with individual facilities? Well, um, the way the Department of Justice deals with individual facilities is to survey every individual facility as if it's new construction, because that's the way you identify the barriers. And then after the fact, you determine in the program accessibility analysis how much change needs to occur in order to afford access to individuals with disabilities to the program in its entirety. And frankly, under the ADA, in most circumstances, unless making 
a modification really is an undue financial and administrative burden considering all of the resources of the state or local government entity. Um, uh, changes are made even in pre-ADA facilities to bring them up to the level of accessibility required by the standards. And when David talked about the rheostat, um, the application of the rheostat in the ADA context is intended to, to provide very bright lighting in facilities, you know, making it accessible as much as possible for individuals with disabilities. The standard applicable under Title III of the ADA for private facilities is a different standard for existing facilities. It is called readily achievable barrier removal, and the standard is different because Congress recognized that Title III of the ADA applies to large and small entities. And readily achievable barrier removal is a recognition that the economics of large entities are very different than the economics of, for example, a mom and pop facility. So red, you, you still survey the facility in the same way, identifying all of the barriers that are there. But after that survey is done, then what you do is you consider the economics of the situation. And an entity that has significant finances overall, including, you know, if it's a branch, finances at a headquarter level, for that kind of an entity, readily achievable barrier removal is a really high standard because a lot is readily achievable for those types of entities because they have the money to do it. For a mom and pop type of entity, readily achievable barrier removal will be very modest. Um, and it'll mean probably getting individuals with disabilities in the door and providing very modest access. The landscape architecturally of the ADA has recently changed. From 1991 until 2010, um, there were certain standards applicable um, under the ADA, and then on September 15, 2010, new standards were put into place. Um, on September 15, 2010, um, there were new standards published. Those standards became effective as of March 15, 2012, and the 2010 standards must be followed for new constructions, alterations, program access, and readily achievable barrier removal. However, there is a, a tweak that I'm going to add to that by saying that if a facility was built before March 15, 2012, and it was in full compliance with ADA requirements or brought into full compliance with ADA, compli with ADA requirements. There's a safe harbor. If it wasn't brought into full compliance with ADA requirements prior to March 15, 2012, then all of the requirements must be brought up to the 2010 standards that were adopted by the Justice Department. And on uh, the slide that I think is currently up, um, it, it shows what standards were permissible um, prior to March 15, 2012. Um, between um, September 15, 2010 and March 15, 2012, under Title II of the ADA, it was possible to use either the new 2010 standards, either the old 1991 standards with no elevator exception or UFAS, and for housing during that period of time, UFAS was the most likely choice that people would have been made because it was the easiest one to comply with. The 2010 standards that are currently in place 
um, are based on the ADA accessibility guidelines, which were adopted by the United States Access Board in 2004. Um, and uh, chapters one and two of those contain um, application and scoping requirements that tell you how they apply and what they apply to. And then the technical requirements are contained in chapters three to 10 of the standards. Um, and then um, when it issued its regulations, the Department of Justice put into place some additional requirements that are incorporated into the ADA standards. And these are very important to um, know about, particularly if you're going to be out inspecting housing, because some of the provisions that are in the Department of Justice regulations are applicable to housing. Um, for Title II, uh, those additional requirements are contained in Section 35.151 of the regulations. And for Title III, they're contained in Section 36.406 of the regulations. And um, I said if you're going to go out and do inspections of housing, it's important to know about them. That's because they relate to residential dwelling units, um, housing at places of education, such as universities, medical facilities, such as nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Um, the information on the ADA standards is available on the Justice Department website at www.ada.gov, and from time to time, they are doing webinars. And if you really want, you know, if you want a refresher after this, you want to look on the ADA website and see when they're offering the next webinar on the requirements. Um, with respect to dwelling units, the requirements of the ADA are similar to, but not identical to the requirements of Section 504. Um, uh, and so if you're already familiar with um, UFAS requirements, or you become familiar with UFAS requirements, as you go through the training with Sarah later in, Sarah Pratt later in the day, um, she will also be covering some of the issues related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, one of the challenges that you will have is the application of multiple laws. And in order to know what to inspect, you really do need to know um, what laws apply. Many projects are subject to both um, Section 504 and the ADA, and of course, anything that is multifam covered multifamily housing um, that was designed and constructed after um, March 13th, 1991 is also subject to um, the Fair Housing Act. And um, for the ADA and Section 504, that March 13th date is not a magic date. You need to survey the facility if, um, regardless of when it was constructed, designed and constructed. So just to recap, um, uh, the Fair Housing Act requirements apply to 100% of covered dwellings. Section 504 requirements apply a greater level of accessibility in 5% and 2% of those dwellings. And um, ADA requirements apply depending on the type of facility that's issue, that's at issue, typically for the same types of multifamily um, dwelling units that you're surveying with respect to the Fair Housing Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, the ADA applies the, the same or very, very similar uh, requirements to the same percentages of units that Section 504 does. 5% units with mobility features and 2% of units with communication features. Um, state and local um, uh, disability rights laws also apply to these properties. And if they contain more stringent requirements, they must be complied with. If they contain less stringent requirements, they are overridden by federal law. 
Um, and then we finally have our uh, summary slides. Um, Fair Housing Act um, applies to both private and public housing when it's covered multifamily dwellings, and we have a regulatory citation to you for you. Uh, Section 504 applies to programs and activities receiving federal financial assistance. And um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title II, applies to state and local governments, programs, services, activities, and facilities that are owned, operated, or sponsored by state or local governments. Title III of the ADA applies to um, public accommodations um, such as shelters, halfway houses, um, any types of social service establishment housing, and in all private housing, rental and leasing offices. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeanine. I think there's a question that it bears uh, uh, asking and answering again with respect to Title II and its application to uh, state programs like the allocation of tax credits uh, or the use of uh, mortgage revenue bonds uh, to support housing, uh, multifamily housing projects. Uh, what would be the effective date when states uh, using those uh, uh, tools would, would, were required to uh, uh, conform to uh, the ADA? The design and um, construction requirements applied as of January 26, 1992. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we're going to take a break now. Uh, gold stars for the Office of General Counsel for finishing early. Uh, I think uh, we will return here at, um, we're going to have a little bit of extra time for a break, so we will resume at 1045, and as soon as we're off the air, I will have um, a couple of specific comments for those of you who are here in person. <laughs>